Okay, uh, so today we'll be covering Trees of Europe, uh, then we'll wrap up our Trees of the World unit on Thursday covering Trees of Asia. And so looking at Europe, uh, it's about the same land area as the United States, 3.9 versus 3.8 million acres, or not acres, square miles, uh, but it has more than twice as many people. So you have a very high population density, um, and that more than anything has, has impacted the forest that we're going to see in Europe. So here's uh, the topography where you have several different mountain ranges, the Alps, the Pyrenees, and the high point is actually in Russia at about 18,500 feet, Mount Elbrus. But lots of areas at or near sea level, including areas like the Netherlands, where much of it may be slightly below sea level. And so we have a lot of different uh, temperate, mostly uh, ecoregions uh, that may be very similar to many that we're going to see here in North America. Uh, you have large areas with the Mediterranean climate, named after the Mediterranean Sea right here. That'll be similar to some of our climates out in California here in the U.S. Uh, then you have areas that are kind of similar to um, East Texas and Spain. You've got areas more like northern hardwoods on up to boreal forests up in Scandinavia. So lots of different ecoregions. And here's uh, basically a map showing you the forest cover. And you'll see there's a lot of forest cover over much of Europe that's just not there anymore. And that's the heavy impact of, you know, 730 million people today. Uh, where there's been heavy urbanization, so a lot of it's urban forests. There's been timber harvesting there for thousands of years. And so the forests are heavily impacted. They are grading a little bit. It's about 50% forested land, which is about what we have here in East Texas. We've got slightly more than 50% forested land. Uh, but that forest is mostly restricted to urban forests. The mountainous areas, you can see those mountain ranges on this map of forests, and then boreal forests up here in the lesser populated areas in northern Europe. You're going to recognize almost all the genera and families that we cover today, and there's good reason for that. Uh, North America and Asia and Europe were all part of one continent at one point, and so just like we saw with the austral pears, allopatric speciation has occurred. And so many of the trees that we have in Europe are oaks, pines that are the same as our oak pines and pines here in North America, just different species, but same genes. So let's start here. Uh, let's start with Norway spruce. And so Norway spruce is a uh, Pinaceae family, Picea abies, Picea abies. And so Picea is the spruce genus. This is the first spruce we're covering. Abies is actually the genus on our firs. And so what this is saying is that this is a spruce that looks like a fir. And so let's spend a, a few minutes here going over some of the differences between spruces and firs. And so we can write this up on the board here, hopefully. And so we'll actually break down a few of our conifers. So we've got spruces, firs, pines, larches, hemlocks. And that's certainly not all of our different gymnosperms, but that's a few of the more common ones that we can look at and sort of go over ways that you can tell them apart. Uh, we're not used to that because we don't have native spruces, firs, larches, or hemlocks here in East Texas. So we don't see them in lack. Um, but with spruces, the genus is Picea, and the needles are prickly. So if you grab spruce needles with your hand, they're very pointed at the end. They're short, you know, about that long, so half an inch. They're pointed, so you'd grab them and it would prick you. The firs are in the genus Abies. Firs and spruces look very similar to one another, uh, but the needles on firs, we could put amicable here, friendly. So firs are friendly, spruces are spiky, Abies amicable, Picea prickly, a couple different mnemonic devices. But if you grab the needles that look very much like a spruce needle on a fir, they don't prick you. They're not pointing at you. And then when you keep looking at those needles, spruce needles are square in cross-section, so they roll in your fingers. So 
So they'll roll and go kind of clunk, clunk, clunk. Fur needles are flat. So here's a cross section of a fur needle. It's flat. And so it won't roll in your fingers. It's flat. Then when we look at the twig, the twigs on a spruce have these raised woody pegs that the needle grows off of. Raised woody peg that the needle grows off of. And these raised woody pegs, one of them is called a sterigma. So the plural of that is sterigma. Furs don't. On a fur twig, the needle attaches directly to the twig. It looks like a little suction cup, like the end of a Nerf dart or something like that. So the needle just comes straight off the twig. And so especially on the older dead limbs, you'll see all these raised woody pegs, the sterigma, on a, a spruce, or take the twig, run your hand down the twig, and it's going to be very, very rough. These are obvious. You'll see them. You'll feel them. That's not going to happen on a fir tree. Okay? And so with the pines now, we know they're in the pinus genus, and we know that they have needles and fascicles. So the needles aren't born singly, except for one of our pinions, pinus monophylla, that has one needle per fascicle, but they have the fascicle, and then the needles, you know, we've seen mostly three in our southern pines. And that fascicle, it's actually a modified short shoot. So it's kind of almost like a tiny little twig holding those three leaves together. The neat thing is on pines, if it has three needles per fascicle, you can try this out with any of our pines outside the building here after class. You can take those three needles per fascicle and kind of start at the base and work your way up, but you can stick them back together and they'll be completely round in cross section. And if it's three needles per fascicle, they're kind of split like this. So there's needle number one, two, and three. So if it was two needles per fascicle, it'd be split right down the middle. If it was five, it would be split in fifths, like slices of pie. Um, so needles and fascicles. Larches are in the genus Larix. They're deciduous. And what the larches have, there's a twig for you. They have short shoots. So you'll have a short shoot. And then you have a whole bunch of needles coming off the short shoot. Okay, a whole bunch of needles. I know I drew that the same as the sterigmata, but the short shoot is large, the sterigmata is small. Um, and so this gives it kind of a sea urchin look. So it's got kind of this spiny sea urchin look on the larches. The hemlocks are in the genus Suga. And with the hemlocks, they've got a twig and the needle We'll have a tiny little petiole and then a tiny little blade. And so all this is very small, like less than a quarter of an inch. So it does look like a gymnosperm. It looks like a needle. But then if you look at it real up close, it actually looks like just a miniature version of a broadleaf. So, so that's how you'll tell those apart. And there's others we're going to learn this semester. But these are all in the Pinaceae family. Okay. Get the slides going again. Okay, so having seen all that, if you get the needles on this doorway spruce, they will be square in cross section. They'll roll in your finger. They'll prick you if you poke the end of it. And then um, the twig, you, you can't really see it here, but it has those raised woody pegs. It has this there body. The cones on this are pretty large for a spruce. Many of the other spruces have smaller cones, but these are like five inches long. So they'll be real long. Uh, the spruces generally don't have arm dumbos. They're not prickly. And the scales on the cones will be softer. Another good way to tell spruces and firs apart, if you find cones on the ground, it's a spruce. Fir cones are born upright in the top third of the crown, and the scales fall off of up in the tree. So you don't have whole cones falling to the ground. You will with Norway spruce here. The Buds look like little rose flowers or something, so they're kind of unique looking buds there. And then the form of the whole tree, it's got these branches that swoop out, and then a lot of the smaller branches hang straight down under them. So why might that be? Why would it have this form? Snow loading is the obvious hypothesis. These have to shed a lot of snow. 
they've looked at it and it, it's hard to discern areas with more snow that are tied more to this form. Um, one thing that you do notice is they do tend to droop more. And so they'll droop more as the tree becomes stressed. So in, in part, it may be a stress response. Okay, um, as we keep looking at Norway spruce, Here's the native range, Scandinavia, uh, northern Russia, northern Europe there. It also has been established at higher elevations further south. And it's an important timber tree in Europe. There's lots of management for Norway spruce up in Scandinavia. Um, so it's going to be a very important timber species. Of course, they're managing on a long rotation. Growth is slow. They also have different harvesting equipment than what we typically see here in the U.S. I showed you this tree the first day of class. But this is the oldest living known Norway spruce. This is the oldest living tree in Europe um, in terms of a single stem. And it's on a 3,000 foot mountain in Sweden. The top's only 600 years old and 13 feet tall, but they've carbon dated the roots at 9,550 years old. So it just keeps re sprouting. So pretty impressive. Okay, next up we have Scott's pine, Pinus sylvestris. Sylvestris basically meaning of the forest, so it's a pine of the forest. It has two needles per fascicle. Uh, one of the only things you'll confuse it with is our native red pine here in North America. Uh, but when you take a red pine needle and you bend the tip of the fascicle back and you make a circle out of it, you bend it back to the fascicle sheet here, red pine needles will break. Scott's pine won't. So you'll just have a circle of needles. The umbos aren't super prickly on the cone. But the apophyses, this exposed part of the scale, it kind of has a three-dimensional pyramid-like shape to it. So it kind of sticks out at you. And then normally how you notice you've got Scott's pine, the orange bark, very orange colored bark is gonna be a good ID feature. So here's the range map of Scott's pine. I, I could cover it in trees of Europe like we are today. I could also cover it in trees of Asia. It ranges across uh, much of Eurasia. It's the world's northernmost pine, so it can handle pretty cold environments. Um, and you'll notice on this range map, there's Scotland. Or sorry, that was Ireland. There's Scotland. Um, and it barely has any range in Scotland. In much of uh, England uh, and the United Kingdom, it was heavily logged during the Industrial Revolution uh, where they needed wood for construction, but they were also burning a lot of wood for charcoal to smelt iron. And so, you know, a lot of those forests are gone now. And in some areas, uh, national or state parks, uh, they are working to reforest them and bring it back. But if you look at its range map, it's all over parts of Russia and it ranges into China. It has a lot of these disjunct populations in China over here as well. Um, here's the range map where it can be found in North America. And so in North America, it was actually brought into the Northeast and New England some of the first European settlers coming over brought some of these, you know, brought the seed with them. I guess they were worried we wouldn't have enough trees, but it turns out we had plenty of trees. So they didn't really need it, but there were a lot of these plantations established in the 50s in Pennsylvania and New York, and you'll still see them out there in the woods sometimes. And usually, you know, it just looks like a pine stand, and they do have native species of pine up there, but you're looking at it and you're like, man, that mark's orange. And that's usually how you spot that it's a Scots pine. Uh, I took these pictures in China uh, of Scots pine. And so this was actually a 40 year old Scots pine orchard. Uh, this was Jilin province. So it was Northeastern China, uh, right near North Korea. Um, and they had actually planted Korean spruce underneath them just because they didn't want to waste any land. They were trying to use all the land they could to grow something. This was actually a, a cool area uh, near a city, I believe by Qing. And they had this arboretum out in the middle of the city, but it was also a park. They were using it for both. Um, and they had this rare, uh, you know, disjunct population of Pinus sylvestris uh, that had kind of a different morphology because it was disjunct. Um, and they called it beauty pine and they were working to preserve that one disjunct population. But we were walking around this park and we noticed these guys standing out in the trees and they're just slapping the snot out of the trees just sitting there slapping them for like 10 straight minutes. I don't know if it was a workout or if there was something with the trees, but we never did find out. Okay, next up we have Austrian pine, Pinaceae pinus nigra. 
Australian pine will get these two different bud types that can help you identify it. And some of our other pines do as well. This is a vegetative bud right here. And so it looks like an old school Christmas light, sort of in shape. And then what's going on with this bud on the right is this bud has that vegetative bud in the middle, but then it has a bunch of stroboli around the base. So it's a mixed bud between vegetative and reproductive tissues, which gives it more of that swollen sort of Hershey kiss shape. Uh, Austrian pine ranges widely ac across Europe. You can see uh, it's not found up north where you would expect Scots pine to be. It's gonna be more in Mediterranean climates, Turkey. It's found further south. And what Austrian pine is really known for is having a very dense, thick crown. So there's lots of different cultivars of Austrian pine. And because of that thick, dense crown, they've brought them into the US. And so again, a little too hot in Texas for us to see them here, but you'll see these sometimes up in the Northeast. And uh, they were planting them all over the place as an ornamental, it was pretty popular. But then they started getting Diplodia tip blight. Diplodia tip blight, it, it's native to Europe, um, but it was brought over along with the tree and some of the cultivars apparently are pretty susceptible to it. Most of the time they won't die like this tree did, but it'll discolor significant portions of them. And if you're using a tree as an ornamental, you don't want a bunch of it, you know, half dead. So Austrian pine has fallen out of favor in terms of being a popular urban tree. Okay, next up we have the Italian cypress. So we've moved out of the pine AC to the cupress AC, and this is cupressus sempervirens. Uh, so what's a sempervirens? So semper always, virens alive, always alive. It's an evergreen. Okay, um, so that's what sempervirens means. The foliage will look a lot like eastern red cedar but the cones are two or three times the size of Eastern Red Cedar's cones. And you can see they're much woodier than Eastern Red Cedar's cones are. But normally how you identify this is the form. It's one of the most columnar formed trees, column shaped, real narrow crown tree. Another common name for this is pencil cypress, just because they're kind of shaped like a pencil. They're not using the wood for pencils. And so you will see this all over the Mediterranean region in Europe but you can also plant it across much of the southern United States and out into California. And so you will very commonly see these Italian cypresses planted at like fancy restaurants, fancy neighborhoods. Uh, it, it's a popular ornamental tree. In Europe, this thing can actually live up to about 2000 years old. So it's got a pretty impressive lifespan. Uh, the Roman and Greek cultures would plant it in cemeteries for religious purposes. And it's often planted in cemeteries uh, in the Muslim world as well today. Uh, so it's got a, a lot of religious significances to some cultures. And then this is probably why it's most famous. So these were painted by who? Yeah, so these are Van Gogh's and he painted a lot of these Italian cypress trees. Uh, and so you can see that narrow columnar form um, even with this style of artwork. Okay, next up, we've got English yew, Taxaceae taxis piccata. Um, we have uh, Canadian yew here in North America. I don't think any of you all picked it as a presentation, so I'll probably be covering that one. And those are the only two yews that we're gonna look at all semester. Um, we don't have any native yews here in East Texas. We do have Florida Toria in the Southeast over in Florida, but it's pretty rare. So we don't see many of these around. They'll, they'll remind you of a hemlock once you know what a hemlock looks like, where these leaves are flat and broad. They're still pretty small. You're thinking about half an inch long, you know, maybe a tenth of an inch wide. So they're pretty small, but they kind of look like tiny broad leaves. And then when you look at this thing, you would swear it has a fruit. So you would think it's an angiosperm. But it's just like we talked about with the podocarps, uh, where this is not a ripened ovary, it is a, re a vegetative tissue serving the same function as a fruit, um, but it's still a gymnosperm since that's not a ripened ovary. These are often called arils, A-R-I-L, arils, with the U's. Uh, many parts of the U are toxic. Uh, some wildlife can eat the arils and it's not toxic for them. And so that helps with seed dispersal. 
The U's, uh, while originally native to Europe, uh, this particular English U, Taxus baccata, has been planted all over the world. It's a popular urban tree. They can get really large, not in terms of height, but in ter terms of the width of the trunk. So this is one found in France that's a couple thousand years old. And this tree got wide enough that, uh, you know, several hundred years ago, they built a chapel inside the tree. A small chapel, but still, they were able to turn one tree into a little building. So they can get pretty big. They can live a long time. Um, the wood on this is used for all sorts of furniture today. So it's a popular wood for furnishings. Um, folks that have livestock aren't really a fan of English yew because again, you know, the vegetation is mostly poisonous and toxic. And so it can kill horses and other animals um, if, if they eat too much of it. Uh, but one of the most famous things that English yew has been used for over the years uh, would be the Welsh or English longbow. And so this sort of uh, brought to an end, um, along with, of course, gunpowder um, and artillery, uh, brought to an end, you know, sort of that age of knights in armor, right? Because once they developed this longbow, it could actually pierce through a lot of the armor, the plate armor they were wearing. But these bows would be about six feet long. Um, they would have draw weights between 60 and 185 pounds, which is just insane. I mean, everyone shooting today has compound bows where it takes most of the draw weight out of it. But even people with recurved bows, you know, they're probably 45 pounds, 50 pounds at most. So, you know, incredible draw weight, took a lot of strength to pull these back, but that would give them an effective range of 180 to 250 yards. Um, a lot of target shooting today is like 40 yards at most, not too far. Um, so pretty impressive what they could do with them. They could shoot six arrows a minute. And so this really, you know, changed a lot of the landscape and a lot of the warfare um, in the United Kingdom. Okay, so that was the gymnosperms. Uh, next up, let's look at angiosperms. And so this is pedunculate oak, Fagaceae Quercus rover. The leaves you could very easily confuse with our own Quercus alba. They look very much like white oak leaves. But why it's called pedunculate oak is right here. So leaves are held on a twig by petioles. Fruits are held on a twig by peduncles. So there's a real long peduncle holding that acorn. What you tend to see on the acorns on the species that we're learning in lab is that they're sessile. There's no observable petiole. It looks like they're just stuck right on to the twig. And so that's gonna be important in a minute. If you look at the form of this tree, I mean, I could have stuck in a picture of a post oak out in a pasture here in Nacogdoches County, and it could look exactly like that, right? And so an oak is an oak is an oak. And so this has a very similar form to white oak, post oak, a lot of the oaks that we've learned in lab. Ecologically, it's extremely important. This is a very wide ranging oak in the temperate regions of Europe. Uh, so it's common in many different forest ecosystems. In England alone, they've identified more than 100 different species of insects, birds, small mammals, lichens uh, that rely on Quercus rover, pedunculate oak. So, um, it ends up being a pretty important species ecologically. Uh, our white oak and many of our oaks here in the U.S., they live like 500 years. If left to its own devices, Quercus rover would probably live to about 500 years old. Uh, but because, because people have been tending these trees for so long, they've been coppicing them, where you let them get so big, then you cut them down and rely on the stump to sprout again. They've also been pollarding them where you cut back the limbs and then you count on those sprouting again. And some of these that have been managed heavily over the centuries through coppicing and pollarding, uh, they think they can bump that lifespan up to about 1500 years. Um, so there's a lot of these Quercus rovers still out there today that are famous trees where, you know, treaties were signed under them, battles were fought near them. And so they have a lot of historical significance because they're so long lived. Compare that now with Cecil oak. Quercus petraea. See how the acorns are stuck right on the twig? There's no long peduncle. There you go, Cecil oak. These leaves are also going to be much more reminiscent of our swamp chestnut oak. They look less like Quercus alba, they look more like Quercus michoia. But then again, you know, I could show you this photo and it could look just like a post oak out here in a pasture in Nacogdoches County. So it's still an oak. 
This is also wide ranging. It handles wetter sites than Quercus rover. So it does better on wetter sites and that also makes it do better at higher elevation. Or in temperate regions, the higher you go, the more precipitation you tend to get. And so it does better at those higher elevations. There is actually a hybrid between Quercus petraea and Quercus rover. And so sometimes we name hybrids. Uh, so they named this hybrid Quercus X rosaceae. So they gave it the family name for the rose family, Quercus X rosaceae. So, um, and the hybrid is intermediate in phenotype. They're usually easy to identify. Uh, it'll have, you know, a shorter peduncle, you know, and it'll have leaves that look like a cross between the two. So, in terms of value, uh, Quercus petraea is a pretty important tree. So who's heard of French oak? You get wine or brandy or something aged in French oak barrels. French oak isn't a species. Usually when they're saying French oak, they're referring to Quercus petraea. So it's a very popular oak that's used in barrel making. Again, in the white oak group. So since it's in that white oak group, not too many tannins in the wood, got the tyloses, so the barrels won't leak. So it has what they call tight cooperage, just like our white oaks will here in North America. So anytime you hear French oak in the terms of some sort of aged alcoholic beverage, it's probably a Quercus petraea barrel that they've used. So. Um, this is the National Tree of Wales uh, right here. So pretty popular tree. Okay, so also within the Pagaceae, we have European beech. This week in lab, we're learning American beech, which is Phagus grandifolia. I know it's called grandifolia, but its leaves just aren't that big. They, they're perfectly normal size looking leaves to most of us. They're gonna be comparable in size to dogwood, black gum, persimmon, you know, a lot of the trees that we've learned. Um, and they're honestly, they're the same size as European beech leaves. So this is Phagus sylvatica, sylvatica again, meaning of the forest, basically. The easiest way to identify this beech or our American beech is the very smooth gray bark. Normally what we've seen is trees like black cherry. They start out smooth when they're young. And as they get older, the bark gets rougher. Our young oaks have smooth bark. As they get older, that bark gets rougher. But what happens with the beeches at any size, at any age, they have very smooth gray bark. So it'll look like the hide on an elephant or something like that when they get pretty big. So you'll just be walking around the woods and I mean, you just notice them. No tree has bark that smooth or gray. It would be like a sugar berry if it didn't have any of the warts at all, is what you're expecting. We'll see that this week out at Tonka where we've got a really big American beech. These are the fruits, and I've already shown you trees in the Nothopagaceae in the Southern Hemisphere that have fruits just like this, uh, where they have small nuts, and three or four of them are held together in this bird husk. And on both this and American beech, that's gonna be, you know, about the size of a dime or so. So they do have some wildlife value for masting. However, they're not the highest wildlife value species. Compared to oaks and other taxa, they mast very irregularly and then it's a smaller nut, so it's just not as reliable or as productive for wildlife. Now, how you identify a beech leaf? They have very straight parallel veins, each ending in what looks like a little bristle tip. So very straight parallel veins, each ending in, in a bristle, or a little sort of looks like a prickle at the end. It's not gonna prick you. It's like Carolina laurel cherry. You can squeeze it in your hand and you'll be just fine. I don't have a picture of the buds on there for you, but the buds are long and pointy. So the buds will be half an inch long, real pointy. They look like little cigars or something like that. So the buds could even remind you of a small thorn. So the buds are usually an easy ID feature. So all this stuff we've just gone over is true of American beach and it's true of European beach. So how do you tell the two apart? Because European beach will sometimes be planted ornamentally here in the United States. It's, it's a crazy specific trick. What you do, so I've got the midrib of this leaf right here. I only look on one side of the midrib. It doesn't matter which side. And I count the veins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven on that one. If it has seven to nine veins, it's a European beach. If it has 11 to 14 veins, it's an American beach. So that's a crazy level of detail. But otherwise, these are pretty much the same tree because they probably evolved from a common ancestor through allopatric speciation. And so here's the range map on European beech. It's a very important tree across Europe, very wide ranging. 
And I've got a couple different old growth stands we can look at. So some people use the term old growth real loosely where they just mean trees that are old and that's all it means. Um, when you all get into silviculture and ecology, it has a much more specific meaning where it has nothing to do with the history of the forest. It has nothing to do with whether you've harvested timber or not or the age of the trees per se, but it's a structural definition where you need so many trees of a certain size, you need young, old, and medium age trees all out there at the same time, so an uneven age forest, and you need a lot of structural complexity, standing dead trees, down dead trees, and just a lot of complexity out there. Um, these two forests were managed very differently. Uh, so when you think about how we manage forests, we really started doing that in the United States in the early 1900s with Gifford Pinchot, right? Well, where did Gifford Pinchot and Shank and a lot of the other early foresters in the United States learn forestry? They went over to Germany, okay? And so they brought forestry to the United States from Germany. This is a beach stand that was managed silviculturally for a long time in Germany for centuries. And so you can see it's a very simple forest. They've managed it as an even age forest. All those trees are about the same age as one another. And so not much going on there. It's very structurally simple, but you can still manage it for a lot of different directions. On the upper right here, this is an example of an old growth beech forest in the Carpathian mountains of Europe. And so here it really hasn't been managed very much. They may have been cutting some firewood on it, but not much in the way of management beyond that. And so this is a more sort of natural, if you will, or virgin old growth forest that's been minimally impacted by man. And so you see large trees, small trees, much more complex. There's down dead woody debris, standing dead trees, more complexity there. The average size of one of these beaches, uh, when they get to this stage, they may be, you know, a yard across, so more than three feet PBH. So they're pretty large trees, you know, from our context here in the Eastern US or Europe. Not a big tree for the Western U.S. Um, there's one cultivar, variety purpurea, that's commonly planted in the U.S. Um, and in the spring and in the fall, it will have very purple leaf color. Of course, they need chlorophyll or this thing's going to die. And so in the summer, it's going to have green leaves, but they're really, really dark green. So if you're ever in a city somewhere where there's planted trees, you're not going to see it in Texas. It's going to be further north. Um, and you see it, it looks like an American beach, but with purple leaves. Count the veins on one side, it's gonna be seven to nine. It's gonna be a European beach, a Fagus sylvatica uh, that's planted ornamentally. Okay, so we've learned river birch in lab. Here's European white birch, Betulaceae betula pendula. And this is similar to two native species found further north in North America that we have here. It's similar to gray birch and it's similar to paper birch. So this is planted in North America, so you gotta be able to tell them apart. So here's how you do that. Two catkins, two catkins, two catkins. I'm seeing a bunch of leaves with two catkins. Paper birch has three and our native gray birch has one. So you can count the catkins. That's an easy way to tell them apart. The leaves will be generally triangular and they'll have doubly serrated margins. That's true of our river birch, right? But compared to gray birch and paper birch, this has a much longer, more noticeable acuminate tip on the leaf. So look for the acuminate tip. That'll tell you that you've got a European white birch. Otherwise, that bark looks just like paper birch. Gray, bark, gray birch bark looks a lot like paper birch as well. So don't use the bark, except once you get a tree that's like a foot DBH, look down at the base of the tree and look around the whole tree at the base. And for some reason, European white birch will always get this section where instead of having that white papery bark, it looks like someone's glued persimmon bark or charcoal to the tree, but just on one side, not on both sides for some reason. So uh, paper birch and gray birch don't do that. So those are good ways you can tell it apart from our native birches if they're planted here in the U.S. ornamentally. So very broad ranging in the boreal forest in some temperate regions at higher elevations. So it can handle cold climates pretty well. And so you'll see it as far south as Virginia, Kentucky, uh, but it's going to be up in the Northeast Canada and the Pacific Northwest where you see European white birch planted. Um, this birch and the, the other birches I've been discussing, paper and gray birch, they're early successional species. They're short lived. They tend to only live 100 years and they're generally smaller trees, 60, 70 feet tall, 50 feet tall, you know, foot to 
maybe a little bigger than a foot DBH, but they don't get big and they don't live very long. Uh, so Finland's got a pretty big sauna culture. Um, and so when putting this together, I found out, don't Google image search sauna at work, you get a lot of weird pictures, uh, but there's one from Frozen for you. Uh, but you know, they'll have uh, a lot of birch boughs, from European white birch that they keep in the saunas. People will whack themselves with the bow. Uh, they've got compounds in them called betulin. There's no proof of it, but they'll claim there's all sorts of medicinal value. In them, so. Okay, so still within the betulaceae, uh, this is our only example this semester of a hazel or a hazelnut. So that's the Coriolis genus. We have species here in the eastern U.S. like Coriolis cornuta, beet hazelnut, that will be similar to this tree. This one is Coriolis avalana. It can grow as a small tree up to about 50 feet in height, but it's often a multi-stem shrub. So you tend to see it as a shrub or a bush. And like everything in the Betulaceae, we're noticing the doubly serrate margins on the leaf, but these tend to have rounder leaves. Now this is called hazel, and it's really known for the nuts of all species, but especially this species. Um, they're sold as hazelnuts. And so this uh, was originally native to the Balkans. So Greece, Serbia, this sort of area, it's it spread widely over much of uh, Europe. Um, and about 75% of the world's production of hazelnuts actually comes out of Turkey right here. Um, so it, it's a pretty popular nut for eating. Uh, you can see, you know, hazelnut flavored candies, coffee, stuff like that. Uh, so it's a pretty popular for its nut, not for timber. It has no timber value. Um, it's been planted ornamentally all over the place too. In England, they plant it as hedgerows. So you planted it on your property border and then you can get the nuts off it as well. So. Okay, next up we have large leaf linden. And again, you all are recognizing all the families and the genera as well. Tiliaceae tilia, platyphylos. So in Europe, the tilia genus isn't called basswood. They're called lindens. They're also called limes. This might be called large leaf lime. Um, this does not produce a citrus fruit that you're going to want to use to make a margarita out of. It's called a lime because it prefers soils that have a higher pH. So if you lime an ag field, that's to raise the pH. So that's why this would be called large leaf lime. They're pretty big trees. They can get over 100 feet tall, several feet BBH. But just like our basswoods here in the U.S., they don't really have much timber value. The wood is softer, stringy, and so just not much timber value. Now we have not seen the fruit on the Carolina basswood that we learned in lab. That tree wasn't fruiting. But if it did, it would look just like this. It's a really weird fruit where what you'll see, it looks like there's a willow oak leaf sweeping off of it, but that's a bract for the fruit. And then underneath that, you have a peduncle that's holding three or four little nuts. And so totally unique fruit that we don't see on any other tree we're gonna learn this semester. And that's going to be true of everything in the Tilia genus. So if you ever see that out in the woods around here, that's definitely a Carolina bass. Same kind of heart-shaped leaf with the serrated margin. It's just a little bigger than what we would expect on Carolina bass. Uh, like many of the trees I'm showing you, they've got a pretty wide range. You know, they're important trees, uh, ecologically, if not economically. Um, this is a pretty popular urban tree. And so the, they've been pollarding it for a long time, cutting the branches back, kind of like what you see around here is crepe myrtle, right? Where they cut the crepe myrtles way back. Um, except if you think about Europe, they're planting a pretty big tree here as an urban tree. And many of these cities were designed before cars were invented. So they may have real narrow streets. So they got to keep the trees small. So they'll do that just by hacking them back like that. So that was large leaf linden. Here's little leaf linden, Tilia cordata. And this is a popular ornamental here in the United States. It looks like a Carolina basswood, but with smaller leaves that are shiny. Um, and it'll grow with a form if you plant it as a street tree. It'll remind you of Bradford pear, if you know what Bradford pear is. If not, we'll learn it week 10 in lab, calorie pear. Um, the leaves will overlap in size with our native basswood. So you don't wanna use the leaf size to tell them apart. What you wanna to try to do is look on the tree or down around the ground and find the fruit and if you roll it in your finger, little leaf linden has a rib nutlet. So it's kind of four ribs, so it goes clunk, 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 rolling in your fingers. Um, our native basswoods, the nutlets are unribbed. So you won't feel that. 
Okay, so here is Norway maple, Acer platinoides. This will grow in the same range as sugar maple when planted here in the US, and the tree looks very similar to a sugar maple. There's three key differences if you're in Pennsylvania, Ohio, or New York to tell this apart from a native sugar maple. And that native sugar maple, of course, looks very much like Acer floridanum or southern sugar maple or Florida maple that we plant. Uh, one, pluck a leaf off. And if you pluck a leaf off a Norway maple, it will exude a milky white sap, just like we've seen on red mulberry in lab. Uh, sugar maple will not do that. Two, get a twig and look at the buds. Uh, the sugar maple buds look just like Florida maple buds, so they're small, tan colored, kind of pointy. This has really much more noticeably swollen, purplish buds to it, so the buds are going to be very different. This was brought into the U.S. because it's got good fall color, handles compacted soils, does well in urban environments. Oops, it became kind of invasive. But the third way to tell it apart from the native maples is going to be the Samara. It's got these Samaras that stick out at a 180 degree angle. Almost all the maples have double Samaras, where you have one Samara right here, another one over here, they're paired. Uh, but usually they, they're kind of flipped the other way. Usually the, the wings curve down and in. Not so on Norway maple. So it's got that handlebar, mustache, pistol peat looking Samara on it, which can help you ID it. So broad native range in Europe, like much of what we've been looking at. Here's where it can be planted in the US, but it's not recommended. It's really invasive in this region right here, the Northern Appalachians. From far away, you can't tell this thing in sugar maple apart. You've got to get closer and pluck a leaf or look at the fruit or look at the twig. It's the same tree almost. Okay, next up we have Lombardy poplar, Salicaceae populus nigra. Um, two weeks from now in lab, we're gonna learn Eastern cottonwood, which is Salicaceae populus deltoides. So this tree actually has a lot in common with Eastern cottonwood because they're both poplars. Uh, trembling aspen is uh, populus tremuloides. One of you all give a presentation on that, but it's also a poplar. And so these leaves look very much like trembling aspen. They have a flattened petiole, which makes the leaves shake in the wind. Our eastern cottonwood does that as well. So lots of similarities there. Uh, this is the buds breaking bud, but the buds on this twig will be real sticky. You can almost grab them and they'll stick to your finger. And that's true of most members of the populace genus. Here's uh, the tree growing out wild type where it hasn't been bred at all, and it's just growing in a riparian area. So that could be any of our cottonwoods here in the US. They all look kind of like that. But here's a cultivar bred for a narrow crown planted ornamentally. And so you can see it's a very narrow crowned angiosperm. So it has been planted a lot. It grows over an incredible range. It's also found in Asia and Africa. It won't grow everywhere on that range map. It's gonna be found in riparian zones within drier regions within that range. It's where you tend to find it more like our cottonwoods out west that grow in these gallery forests along the rivers. So while it is planted a fair bit, it's not the most popular tree anymore. Uh, it only lives like 30 to 60 years. It's a pretty short lived tree. And it gets this Dasichia canker that just, you know, starts sort of from the top down and the trees start falling apart. And it gets all these big ugly burls all over it. So uh, they have been using it ornamentally, but it's not really recommended anymore. It's not the prettiest tree. Okay, we've got two more, uh, and this is our horse chestnut. So have fun uh, fitting this scientific name on the exam if this is one of the questions. Uh, hippo is horse, castana is chestnut. So it's the horse chestnut family, Aesculus hippocastana. I don't think anyone picked uh, the buckeyes here in the US, so Ohio buckeye and yellow buckeye for a presentation. I'll, keep, I'll be giving that talk, but it's the same family and the same genus. And then you can see the specific epithet is again Hippocastanum. So despite the name, this tree really is in a completely different family and has nothing to do with American chestnut, Chinese chestnut, any of the true chestnuts. Um, it's super easy to identify. Everything in the Aesculus genus is very easy to ID because it has opposite palmately compound leaves. No other tree that we're gonna learn in lab this semester has opposite palmately compound leaves except the red buckeye we're learning in lab, okay? Um, the fruits on it have a spiky husk, 
And then they've got a real shiny brown fruit uh, with, you know, an area here that's often called the eye. Uh, don't eat uh, our buckeyes here in the U.S. They are toxic. So you definitely don't want to be eating those. Uh, you can see it planted here as an urban tree. It gets pretty big. It's been planted as an urban tree in the U.S. all over Europe. Not really favored anymore because it drops these all over the place. You don't want kids eating them, right? And it's kind of spiky. You don't want to step on it barefoot. And then it's got big old twigs, lots of leaves, so it just sheds a lot of litter. So it, it's not favored anymore as an ornamental tree. This is where it could have been planted in the US, um, and then there's the range in Europe. While it's not favored anymore as an ornamental tree, it's got a pretty important history. So Germany, Bavaria are known for their beer. Those beers are lagers, and lager just means cold agent. Well, they've been making these for hundreds of years, long before modern refrigeration existed. So how do you cold age a beer? You put it in a cellar below ground. But then if you want to keep that cool in an area where you have hot summers, you plant trees over it to try and shade them. Well, these buckeyes, sorry, these horse chestnuts had, you know, really thick, dense crowns. Here you see the white flowers on them. So they started planting these um, over the cellars where they were lagering the beer. Well, once you've got a nice shade tree there and it's a hot day, you may as well throw a picnic table under it and the beer's right there, so you may as well have some beer. And so, you know, they started the, the tradition of the beer garden, you know, with a lot of the trees there actually being horse chestnuts traditionally. Um, and so it helped them lager the beer. It also used to be used as a white dye for linens uh, before synthetic dyes were developed. Okay, our last tree for the day is briar root, Ericaceae, Erica arborea. So it's in the same family as blueberries, rhododendrons, azaleas, the heath family. Honestly, these flowers look extremely similar to blueberry flowers. And the tree we've learned so far that looks the most similar to this is probably tree sparkleberry, except this will get a little bit larger. And it's a really interesting tree. Check out the range map. I threw this one in there so we would have a species with a Mediterranean range. So you're thinking about climates kind of like California, where they have a Mediterranean climate as well. But it's also found down in Africa up to like 10,000 feet elevation on some of these mountains. So uh, found on the Canary Islands, out here to the west of Africa. So it's just all over the place. Um, but the history on this thing, it has this lignotuber that people have been harvesting and using to carve pipes out of for all things. So um, it's been used for that. The above ground part, the wood's been used to make a nice charcoal. And so on private lands, through much of its range, it's been heavily over harvested. Uh, so now it's protected, but in the areas where it's protected, they don't want to harvest it, especially to get the lignotuber. You've got to dig the whole tree up to get that. And so it's been protected, but there's too many of them. They're in too high a density, and so now these areas have built up fuels and they're subject to stand replacing fires. And so they're still doing research. They're trying to figure out how to conserve it, but, you know, allow harvesting in some of these areas where it's protected. So a little bit different story than a lot of the trees we've been talking about. So that's trees of Europe.